So how was your practice this last week? People do the meditations that we've been doing? Yeah. Did you do the breathing or the chin resi? It wasn't too <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so kind of a variety, huh? Um, okay, so this, uh, this is our last session together. So we'll start out um, with some meditation. We'll do the breathing and a little bit of the, the Chen Resi meditation. And then what I plan to talk about is uh, the three principal aspects of the path to kind of give you a general overview of the entire path to enlightenment. Okay? That's my thought. I won't guarantee that that's <laughs> what happens. <laughs> Okay. So begin by bringing your full attention to being here, and to your body sitting here. And be aware of being in the room with a group of like-minded people and feel the support that all the other people's presence and practice offers to you. Remember to set your motivation the meditation and remembering that our whole life is dependent upon the kindness of efforts of others. People who do all the various works in society that enable us to live and to enjoy all the things that we enjoy. So remembering their kindness towards us. Develop a wish to return that kindness. And recognizing that the more we're able to transform our own minds, the more we'll have to give to others. then generate the motivation to do the meditation for the long-term benefit of all living beings. Then do the body scan and release any tension. So I won't lead you through it this week. I think it's good that you learn to do it yourself. <clears throat> now try and get a feeling of great love and great compassion for living beings. And imagine what it would feel like to be completely unafraid and completely open when you are with others. Try and get a sense of what it would feel like that every time you saw a living being, you felt close and you felt warm towards that person, really wishing them well. What would that feel like?
And so imagine that love, that compassion that reaches out in an impartial way towards each and every living being, appearing in the symbolic form of Chenrezig, the Buddha of Compassion. So you can think of Chenrezig with a body made of white light, sitting on an open lotus flower and a flat moon disk. And his eyes long and narrow, looking at you with complete acceptance. He's wearing celestial silks, and his ornaments are all the positive qualities and aspects of the path. That's what adorn him. If you would rather visualize compassion appearing simply in a ball of light, that's fine also, whatever you feel comfortable with. And as you imagine Chenrezig, or that ball of light in the space in front of you, get in touch with your own higher aspirations for the path. Think of the things that you want to let go of, the things that you want to develop. And inside of yourself, silently, make a request to the Buddha of Compassion for inspiration and aid to be able to do this. The conversation and the recitation go on at the same time. Amani Peme Hung Amani feeling or t-
tension or fear or illness completely purified by that light. Really feel that. So then the question may come up, how did Chengarazi get to be like that? Yeah. You get some feeling when you do this meditation of Chengarazi's qualities. You get some feeling of uh, your own potential for transformation. And then the question very naturally arises, well, how do I get from where I am to that state? How do I open my heart and develop wisdom in that kind of way? And the Buddha's teachings explain exactly how to do that. It's in a very, you know, systematic way. And there's different ways to talk about uh, the Buddha's teachings. One way being the three principal aspects of the path. Okay, so the three principal kind of aspects that one wants to develop that enable us to become like Chenrezig. Okay, so these three, the first one is the determination to be free. And that's sometimes translated as renunciation, but I don't think that's a very good translation. And then the second aspect of the path is the altruistic intention. And then the third aspect is the wisdom that realizes reality, realizes things as they are. Okay? So let's go back to the first one, because the terms don't always tell you what it feels like. Okay, so the, the first one, the determination to be free, this is a very strong in determination that's felt in the heart. It's not an intellectual thing, but a thing that's felt in the heart where we really want to be free of this whole cycle of existence that we're stuck in. So last week we talked about rebirth, we talked about how we cycle from one rebirth to another under the influence of our ignorance and anger and attachment and all the actions that we create out of those three poisonous attitudes and how we cycle in that way, um, experiencing so many difficulties all the time. So the determination to be free is saying enough is enough, I want out. Yeah, I'm fed up with that. And I want to arrive at a state of lasting happiness. Okay. Now, this is sometimes translated as renunciation. But renunciation, in English, has a very strange meaning. And we have very strange associations. Because we think of renunciation as, you know, the world is terrible, I'm throwing it away, and I'm going to go live on the top of a mountain, just me and my nettles. You know, <laughs> I'm going to be like Miller F. on the top of the mountain, renounce the world, and because the world stinks, and here I am. And, and so we have this kind of fantastic ideal of being this, you know, great yogi, holy person who doesn't need anything or want anything, so renounced, so ascetic. And we also have a tremendous fear of being like that, don't we? Like, what am I going to do without my chocolate? <laughs> you know? And what am I going to do without my TV? And what am I going to do without Green Lake and my rollerblades to go around Green Lake? And what am I going to do without my CD player? And what am I going to do without my partner? And what am I going to do without my money? 
and it's like, oh, well, maybe I'll stay here in samsara. <laughs> I'll stay in cycle of existence because then I can have all these things. So, um, <laughs> okay, so renunciation doesn't give us the, the right feeling for what it's all about, okay? Because we think of renunciation as, you know, some kind of ascetic lifestyle. The actual thing we're trying to renounce or the thing we're trying to give up the, that is the ignorance, anger, and attachment. That's what we're renouncing. Okay? Because those are the attitudes that perpetuate our living in the state of constantly recurring problems. Okay? So we're renouncing the ignorance, anger, and attachment. Now how do we renounce ignorance, anger, and attachment? We can't just say, I shouldn't feel them. We can't just say, I don't want to have them, because they come up all the time, don't they? Yeah, all the time. You know, it's just like all the time, isn't it? <laughs> okay. So how do, how do we renounce them? How do we give them up? Okay. Well, the first thing that we, that we do is we try and find a qualified teacher who's going to teach us how to do it. That's the first thing we have to do. We have to learn, okay? So we have to find a qualified teacher. And we also have to make ourselves into a ready and receptive disciple, a ready, receptive student. In other words, somebody who is open-minded, somebody who is intelligent and can discern things, and somebody who is genuine and sincere and earnest on the spiritual path. Okay? So if we develop those qualities within ourselves, and we also find a teacher who knows the Buddhist teachings, who has practiced them well, who teaches out of compassion, who's very patient, you know, who has meditative experience, who has deep study, you know, who genuinely cares, then we can really begin to work with that person or those people, we can have more than one teacher, and we can begin to get somewhere. <coughs> okay. Then the next thing we need to do is we need to realize our precious opportunity that we have now with the specific rebirth that we have. Okay. So we have a precious human life in which we have all the qualities and the conditions and the freedom and fortune <coughs> necessary to be able to practice a spiritual path. So there's all these different rebirths that we could have taken in cyclic existence. We talked about this last week. But this time, we have a human one. And human beings are very special because we have a certain kind of intelligence that enables us to be introspective, to uh, think conceptually about things so that we can learn the teachings, so that we can apply them to our own lives, so that we can discriminate what to practice and what to abandon. Okay, so we have to really be very appreciative of the present opportunity that we have now. Because if we don't appreciate it, then what's likely to happen is we're likely to, to spend this whole wonderful opportunity we, we have belly aching about the one thing that isn't going right in our life. Okay, so we have the whole potential with us right now to be able to transform my mind and become a fully enlightened Buddha. And instead of recognizing that and appreciating it, we sit and complain about our boss. <laughs> you know? It's kind of, I mean, complaining about your boss seems kind of trivial and a waste of time when, when you think of our human potential, doesn't it? <laughs> you know? I mean, your boss isn't so important that you, know, you have to waste all your time complaining about him. Um, so it's very important to really appreciate the, uh, the fact that we're human beings, that we live in a country where there's religious freedom, that we live in a place where we have access to the Buddhist teachings and to teachers, where we can take classes like this one, where we can go on retreats, to really appreciate our health and the fact that our senses are intact, that we have a supportive group of people around us who can help us, 
And so to really have a sense of joy at this opportunity and therefore want to make our life meaningful by practicing the path, by transforming our hearts. Okay, so that's the next thing we think about on this way to developing the determination to be free. Then the, the, after we think about our precious human life, then we also have to realize that it's not going to last forever, that we're mortal. And even though we have this feeling that I'm not going to die today, you know, our manana mentality again, you know, I'll die later. You know, it's other people who have accidents and die when they're young. It's other people who get illnesses and die when they're get young. When they're young, I'm going to die later. I have too many things in my life I want to do. Well, that kind of attitude is not very uh, in tune with reality, is it? Because we have absolutely no guarantee how long we're going to live. And so, feeling that our life is just going to extend ad infinitum and therefore we can put off our spiritual practice, you know, we have because we have so many exciting things we, we, we want to do now, don't we? You know, we want to go skiing, we want to go to the movies, we want to go on a nice vacation in the summer, we want to get famous, we want to do this, we want to do that. So we have this idea of, oh yes, the spiritual practice is, is very nice, it's very good to do that, but I'll do it after I've retired, you know, when I'm in the old folks' home, when I get tired of playing bingo, <laughs> you know, then I'll sit and I'll do some religious practice. Well, that kind of attitude, you know, we don't know we're going to live that long, do we? You know, we don't know how long we're going to live. We don't know that we're going to have lots of time to practice. And so, we have to really think, well, what is it that's important in our life? Since we don't know how long we're going to live, and since we know that we will die one day, and we don't know when it's going to be. So what really is important? You know, what do we take with us when we die? And this is an incredibly important thing to really think about. Because if we don't think about it now, and, you know, set our priorities in a very valid way while we can, then we're likely just to go through our whole life doing this and that and this and that, arrive at the point when we're dying, look back on our whole life and go, oh boy, if, they, if I had realized I would have died, I would have done it differently. But at that time when we're dying, you know, we can't press the rewind button and go back and relive our lives. It's gone. So it's real important to, you know, keep on top of things and really be aware, what is important in my life? If I were to die soon, what is important? And when we think like this, we begin to see that all of our money and possessions they're nice, and we do need a certain amount of them to stay alive. But when we die, they're not going to come with us. Yeah, we can make a ton of money, have a great house, you know. But when we die, what happens to it all? It doesn't come with us, does it? You know, we spent our whole life working really hard generating a lot of attachment for these things, getting angry at people who interfered with our getting them. And yet at the end of the day, they abandon us. Because they stay here, we go on to the next life. So what this is, is calling into question for us is how do we have a healthy relationship with our possessions and our money? Instead of having so much anger and attachment revolving about them, how can we just do what we need to do for our living, have possessions, but without clinging on to them and without, you know, getting so angry when we don't get what we want? Okay? So it's a question to, to kind of pose to ourselves. And when we reflect on impermanence, it helps us let go of the anger and the attachment. 
Similarly, when we reflect on our own mortality, we start to call into question, well, what's this whole part of me that just wants to be well-liked and well-loved and have everybody's approval and be popular and be accepted and be acknowledged and appreciated and be famous and have a good reputation? You know, what is this part of me that's so attached to other people? Okay, because likewise, when I die, I might have wonderful friends, but they don't come with me when I die. Yeah. In fact, I could be there on my deathbed with everybody I know, hanging around sobbing and crying, don't die, we love you. I can't think of a more <coughs> awful way to die. <laughs> Can you? Than having the people you care about all around sobbing and saying don't die when you have absolutely no choice about the matter? <laughs> you know? It's like, sorry folks. Um, you know, so it doesn't matter how much people love us. When we die, we go alone. So again, you know, if we've spent this whole life always tangled up and worrying about our relationships, what do they think of me? Do they love me? Do they appreciate me? They said this. Oh, my feelings are so hurt. Oh, I've got to be nice to them. Oh, I want people to acknowledge me. I want to be recognized. I want to be famous. I want this. I want that. And we get so tangled up in our relationships sometimes and worry so much about them. And yet, they're all fleeting, aren't they? None of them last forever. And for as long as they do last, they're in a constant state of flux and change. So what use is all of our, you know, this stuff? Hmm? So it, help, it, it makes us ask the question, well, how can I have a healthy relationship with other people? And how can I bond with other people, but without being an emotional yo-yo of clinging to them when I love them and pushing them away when they do something I don't like? How can I have a healthy relationship? And then also when we think about our, our own impermanence, it, it asks us to call into question how we relate to our body. <coughs> Because we love this body so much, don't we? You know? It's been with us since we've been born, even before, when we were in the womb. And we take such good care of this body. We feed it, we pamper it, it has to sit on the most comfortable cushions, it has to see the nicest things, be at the nice temperature, have a good sex life, it has to be beautiful with our hair combed nicely, and, you know? everything to pamper this body. And uh, what happens to this body when we die? <laughs> you know, it, it totally abandons us, doesn't it? Yeah. All the people who want to hug us when we're alive, when we're dead, they don't want to even see our body. <laughs> So, so why do we generate so much attachment to our body being, you know, attractive and having the right clothes and feeling so good when other people praise us for, you know, because we slimmed down or we fattened up or whatever it is we did, you know. They praise us, then we feel good. Why do we pamper this body so much, you know, complain so much when it's uncomfortable, it's too hot, it's too cold, you know? Because this body ultimately abandons us. So again, it's asking us to, to really see, well, how do we relate to our body and how can we have a good relationship with our body? Accept that we have a body, enjoy that we have a body, use our body, to help us practice the Dharma, use our body to help us benefit sentient beings, but not cling on to this body, not always be dissatisfied with it, or complaining because it isn't comfortable enough. OK? 
Okay? So again, when we think about impermanence and death, it helps us let go of a lot of this kind of obsessive attachment to our body, to our possessions and money, and to the people around us. And instead, it helps us just be more even and accepting. You know, relate to things in an even, balanced way without all this push-pull, push-pull. Hmm? Okay. And so after we, we think about um, our own death, some little bit of the determination to be free starts growing in us, doesn't it? Yeah, because we realize that just kind of hanging around in this cycle of rebirth, getting born and dying and, you know, having a body and giving it up, having possessions and giving it up, having friends and lovers and giving them up, again and again, you know, we begin to realize it's kind of a drag. Okay, so a little bit of that determination to be free starts to come. And after that, we begin to consider, well, when I die, where am I going to get reborn? And uh, last week, we were talking about how human beings sometimes act worse than animals, yeah? and how it wouldn't be surprising if people act worse than animals that they get reborn as animals. And we talked about how even in a human body, our mind states in many ways can be like animals' mind states, can't they? Yeah. So we begin to get a little bit concerned about where we're going to get reborn after we die. And that concern leads us to seek spiritual guidance so that we can prepare for our next rebirth, and prepare for our death. And so when we start to seek spiritual guidance, we're looking for a refuge. We're looking for a valid and safe spiritual direction. We're looking for guides on the path that can really show us the way. And so here, we um, begin to learn and appreciate the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha and how they can guide and inspire us along the path. So when we talk about the Dharma, we're talking about the actual consciousnesses that realize reality, the actual transformed mental states that we have, okay? that other people have already actualized, that we want to generate within ourselves. Those that have actualized them are called the Sangha, and then the Buddha is the one who has brought the, the actualization of those positive mental states to complete fruition and taught the path, showed the path, revealed the path due to his own realizations. So we begin to uh, have some confidence in the path shown by the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. We begin to take refuge in it, in other words, to trust it, to feel a connection and a commitment to that path. And we begin to feel that there's some spiritual support in the universe, that we aren't just all alone. You know, that there is a valid path to follow. There are beings who are practicing it right now, and there are beings who have completed it and who have become enlightened due to practicing the path. And so we turn to them for guidance, for teachings, for inspiration. And so that's, in a Buddhist terminology, that's, calling, that's called taking refuge. And then having kind of gotten our spiritual direction clear, in other words, what path we're on and what we're going to follow, then the first thing that the Buddha, Sangha, and Buddha Dharma and Sangha advise us to do is to get our act together. Okay? So getting our act together means basically stop harming others and stop harming ourselves. Just basic ethical discipline. Okay? So what does this entail? Well, it entails uh, not harming others physically, specifically not killing them, you know, respecting life. It entails not taking things that haven't been given to us, so being honest about uh, our dealings with other people 
and respecting others' property. It means avoiding unwise sexual expression <coughs> that could harm ourselves or others. Uh, avoiding lying and deceiving for our own personal gain. Uh, avoiding causing disharmony. You know, the mind that doesn't like when people are harmonious and so we want to cause some dissension so that we uh, get some benefit from it. So that kind of speech that, that creates disharmony. Uh, and also <coughs> avoiding speech that hurts other people's feelings. Speech that is, is harsh, well, you know, for yelling at somebody. Or even speech where we're saying something in a very nice, sweet voice, but we know it's going to cut somebody to the quick. Okay, so avoiding that kind of speech that, that we do be, because we want to hurt others. And then also avoiding wasting a lot of time just talking nonsense. <laughs> like the newspapers have been doing the last few weeks. <laughs> Yeah? How many hours have we spent talking, listening, you know, and everything? You know, I mean, all the news ratings have, have, you know, I guess they're having a huge increase in newspaper sales recently, haven't they? The great scandal of the presidency. Let's all talk about it. You know, incredible waste of time, isn't it? Not to mention taxpayers' dollars. But, I mean, we just waste our time on that kind of stuff. Did he or didn't he? We don't know who his hairdresser is, to ask for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and then avoiding... Um, <laughs> they may subpoena her, too. <laughs> Avoiding, you know, coveting other people's possessions, avoiding planning our revenge and, you know, malicious thoughts, and also avoid just wrong views, you know, having a stubborn, hard, um, skeptical mind that, that won't uh, think about spiritual things. Okay? So avoiding those kinds of actions is what is meant by getting our life together. Okay, so when the Buddha taught about ethical discipline, he didn't teach it as, you know, thou shall not do this because I said so. You know, because, you know, we're Americans, we're not going to listen to anybody. <laughs> yeah. So Buddha's not going to try that approach with us. Um, <laughs> he actually doesn't try it with anybody. But rather, the ethical guidelines are given as guidelines. In other words, you know, the Buddha, through his own realization, was able to see that these actions cause suffering. But it's up to us to look in our own life and check out our own experience and see if we're happier when we engage in those actions or if we're happier when we abandon them. And what are the long-term effects of doing those actions? So we have to ask ourselves these things. Hmm? And when we do, we come to see that our ethical discipline is not something that's coming from outside being imposed on top of us, but rather we've used our own wisdom to discern what causes happiness and what causes suffering. And our ethical discipline is coming from a shift inside here because we realize we want to change. Okay. Then, after that, this is all in the process of developing this determination to be free. We realize that avoiding negative actions and creating positive actions may get us an upper rebirth, you know, in our next life or in several future lives but that those future lives, again, don't last forever. And even if we get a good future life, we're still going to have a lot of problems in it. We're still going to have to re have to work really hard to get what we want and not always be successful. We're still going to work very hard to keep problems away and not be successful. 
you know. And even if we get good future lives, we still have to go through the process of getting born. And then after we get born, we get sick. Then we get old. And then at the end of the day, whoop de doo we die. You know. And we realize that we get a lot of future lives, but it's just going to be playing the same video, you know, alternations on the same video again and again. And at this point we say, I'm tired of this. You know, I'm tired. No matter how many pleasures there are in cyclic existence, yeah, no matter how famous I can be, no matter how loved I could be, no matter what pleasures I can have, I realize that at the end of the day, none of them are going to last. And wherever I get reborn is not going to be a lasting state of happiness, and eventually I'm going to have to leave it. And so we begin to say, I'm tired of this. I want out. And this is where the real determination to be free comes from. Okay, because what we're determining to be free from here is this entire system of birth and death and birth and death and birth and death. Okay, and we're saying, we're saying, look, I have an incredible human potential. <coughs> and I have more potential, you know, than to just continue to go through this cycle again and again and again. No. And I want to be happy, and I'm tired of seeking happiness that doesn't last. I want a happiness that does last. And if it means, in order to get that higher happiness, that I have to stop chasing after the lower happiness, well, I'm going to do it. Okay? And so this is what is meant by renouncing the ignorance, anger, and attachment, because it's giving up the clinging to the lower kind of happinesses. It's realizing that ice cream is nice, but ice cream is not going to make us perpetually happy. You know, and getting a promotion is nice, but it's not the you know going to be the be all and end all of our life. Okay, so we begin to see that real happiness comes through transforming our mind and releasing the negative attitudes. Okay, and in order to release those negative attitudes and develop our positive qualities, if we have to give up our attachment to chocolate, it's no big deal, you know. Yeah. It's like, for the sake of a higher happiness, if I, if, you know, I just don't have time to chase after chocolate anymore. You know, whatever your brand of chocolate is, we all have different, you know, some people have money. Money is their chocolate, and other people have sex, and some people have, yeah, we all have different things, that that's our chocolate. But we begin to realize that our brand of chocolate isn't going to bring the lasting happiness, and if it's going to interfere with our gaining a higher kind of happiness, then we're willing to kind of slowly let it go and not make such a big deal about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're going to determine to be free of that cycle of existence and to really aspire towards a state of liberation. Because when we have eliminated the ignorance, anger, and attachment from our mind stream, then we're no longer compelled by our own confusion to get born again and again and again into a body that gets old and sick and dies. We're free of that. You know? And that's real freedom. I remember when I first met my teacher, it was at the time when women's liberation was becoming very popular. Yeah. He said, women's liberation? You know, everybody wants to be liberated from cyclic <laughs> existence. <laughs> Not just women, you know. Ordinary liberation in society isn't the liberation, you, you know, that you really want, that's really going to make you happy. You know? So it's when we're liberated from our uncontrolled attitudes. That's real happiness. That's real freedom. Okay, so we develop that very strong determination to be free, and the more 
our determination to be free increases, the easier it becomes to practice. Okay? Because what makes it practice, what makes practice difficult now is we're very, very detract, distracted and we don't have a strong motivation to be free of our problems. You know, what we usually have is a strong motivation to have bigger and better chocolate and to be free of the problem of not having chocolate. But we don't really have the motivation to be free of cyclic existence and, and have a state of lasting happiness. So because we don't have that motivation, then we get distracted all the time. Then we just keep on spinning around and having more and more problems. Okay? So as we develop this determination to be free, then practice becomes incredibly easy. You know, you don't have to force yourself to sit on the meditation cushion. Yeah, because you want to, because you realize that it's going to take you somewhere. Good. Okay, so that's the first principal aspect of the path, that determination to be free and to attain a state of liberation. Now, the second principal aspect of the path is the altruistic intention. So this is an attitude within us that wants to become a fully enlightened Buddha so that we'll have the wisdom, the compassion, the skill, all the qualities necessary to benefit others most effectively. So when we have the determination to be free, we want ourselves to come out of cyclic existence. When we have the altruistic intention, we want all living beings to come out of cyclic existence and we're willing to become a fully enlightened Buddha in order to make that happen. Okay? So when we have the determination to be free, that's compassion for ourself. We're wanting ourselves to be free of suffering. When we take that attitude and we switch it and look at others and we realize that whatever situation we're in every other sentient being is experiencing pretty much the same thing then that enables us to open up with a heart of compassion that wants them to be free as well so we may want ourselves to be free and that's a great attitude but when you think that we live in a world where there's, you know, so many sentient beings all around and that they've been kind to us again and again, just to care about our own spiritual well-being is quite limited. I mean, it's pretty selfish even. And so we begin to feel, well, that's not good enough. I can't just free myself because everybody else is just like me. And so here, there's a whole set of meditations that we do to generate that compassionate, altruistic intention. Okay? Because again, we can't force ourselves to have it. We can't just say to ourselves, I should be altruistic. Because unless we feel it, we're not going to feel it. Okay? So we have to deliberately cultivate it. So one way to cultivate it is first by meditating on equanimity. And we did that a couple of weeks ago. Remember when we um, began to see that our attachment to certain people, our aversion to enemies, our apathy towards everybody else, that all of that was coming because we were screening people through the veil of how they relate to me. So if they're nice to me, they're good people from their own side. If they're bad to me, they're creeps from their own side. And if they don't affect me one way or another, why should I care? And we begin to see that those attitudes are completely, I have nothing to do with reality. Yeah. Why? Because everybody at one time or another, if we think of, you know, infinite previous lives, everybody at one time or another has been our dearest friend. Everybody at one time or another has been our enemy. And everybody at one time or another has been a stranger. So how can we point to any other living being and say that one is more important than the next? And when we even look at it more closely, 
how can we even say that I'm more important than anybody else? Because we kind of go through our life feeling like we're the most important one. But actually, you know, we th when we think about it, everybody wants to be happy with the same intensity that we do. Everybody wants to be free of suffering as much as we do. There's nothing special about us. <laughs> but I've been trying my whole life to be special. I mean, we all grow up feeling I need to be special. I am special. Okay. But when you look at it, you know, we're just like everybody else. There's no reason we can say why we're more important. And when we start looking at where our, all of our happiness comes from, yeah, we often feel like I'm the one who brings about my own happiness. I do this and I do that, so I create my own happiness. But when we look at it, really, where does our happiness come from? Yeah, we all ate food today. Anybody here grow the food they ate today? I don't think so. You know, so where did that food come from? You know, who worked the fields? Who planted? Who harvested? Who transported the food? Who packaged the food? Who drove it to the store? Who runs the store? Who put it on the shelf? Who checked it out at the counter? Who packed our bags? You know, we start looking at the food we have, this whole string of other living beings behind it. We look at the clothes we wear. Anybody here make the cloth of the clothes they're wearing? I don't think so. You know, so again, where did it come from? You know, people planting cotton or, the sh you know, people shaving, you know, the, shearing the, the sheep, the sheep who generated, you know, who kindly gave part of their bodies for your nice cozy woolen sweaters. Um, you know, people who, who wove the cloth and cut it and stitched it and designed it and transported it and et cetera, et cetera. You know, so when we start looking around at every single possession we have, every single small thing, you know, you pick up any small thing, and when you think about, you know, where did this come from, there's so many lives lying behind it, isn't it? I mean, a clock, take, we take a clock completely for granted, but when you think about how many people's lives lie behind this clock, you know, I mean, especially it came from plastic. Well, you know, where did the materials come from to make the plastic? And who figured out how to make plastic? I have no idea how to do it. And it's digital. I understand less about that, you know. So who did that? <laughs> you know? And we, we look some, any small, small object that we have that we use and enjoy, completely taking it for granted. There's a whole history of other living beings' time and effort and kindness behind it. Yeah? And we think about anything we have. You think about your job. Again, so many beings. Your job is due to the efforts and kindness and activities of other living beings. Every single thing we enjoy. Every single thing we know. Because we always feel, I'm me, I'm so knowledgeable, I'm so talented. You know, when we came out of our womb, we couldn't even talk. Everything we know, we know because other people taught us. We didn't come out of the womb knowing all these things. Any talent we have, you know, if you can draw, if you can write, if you can figure out computers, if you can make music, it's all because other people taught us. You know, even knowing language, knowing how to read and write. Think of what our teachers, our grammar school teachers, went through with us. Think about that one for a minute. Really, and you get a sense of how kind others have been to us. <laughs> yeah. And you even think of what our parents went through. You know, trying to teach us to speak, trying to teach us to behave properly, you know, teaching us to tie our shoes. I mean, so many small, small things that we took for granted that we only know because people taught us and other people cared about us enough to teach us. 
We really think deeply. We realize everything we have comes because of the kindness of others. So then we start asking ourselves, well, we start looking at ourselves and realizing that usually in the course of a day, we very <coughs> seldom think about the kindness of others and who is it that we, uh, that we think is the most important. Who is it that we look after? All these other sentient beings are kind to us, but who is it that we look after? Da 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 da! <laughs> the center of the universe! Me! Yeah, I mean, from morning till night, who do we think about? Whose happiness are we concerned with? My happiness! It's the most important thing. Okay? So we begin to call into doubt this whole uh, self-centeredness. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, remember? You know, how that self-centered attitude pretends to be our friend but actually deceives us and causes us harm. So when we think about that deeply, then we lose interest in following the self-centeredness. And when we think about the benefit that comes from cherishing others, then cherishing others becomes something that, that is very easy to do. Okay? Because we realize, actually, that when we cherish others, not only are they happy, and so the people in our environment are happier, so that means we're happier. Not only that, but when we open our heart and kindness to others, we're happier. Aren't we? when you're sitting there all tight because you're so afraid people are going to reject you or take advantage of you or misuse you, are you happy? When all your boundaries are nice and solid and made of concrete, are you happy? My apologies to all the therapists here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's, uh, we have to make sure that boundaries don't become concrete and that boundaries don't become walls of defense. Okay? So, we begin to see that there's a lot of benefit that comes from cherishing others. And then that becomes quite easy to do even to the point where there's a meditation where we actually exchange ourself for others in the sense that before I was the one who was most important and others were secondary and we exchange that so that our mind actually begins to see others as most important and ourselves as secondary. Sounds like a pretty radical idea. But it's actually possible, you know. And I think those of you who are parents can get a little feeling of it. You know how when you look at your child and, you know, when your child's sick, you would probably prefer to be sick rather than have your child sick. You know, watching your, your, your infant suffer, you know, it, you feel like, gee, you know, it's better I have it and my child be free. Well, imagine if you could have that feeling towards everybody else, not just your child. Yeah? Where that same kind of love and compassion could be extended to everybody else. Okay? That's what we're getting at. And so when we can actually do that and have that kind of love that wants others to be happy and compassion that wants them to be free of suffering and that feeling of closeness with each and every living being, then there comes a very strong feeling of, you know, I want to bring about their happiness and eliminate their suffering. And we start looking around and saying, well, how can I do this? You know, I mean, I can open a lot of food banks, but that's not going to solve the world's problems, is it? It's good, okay? Giving food to the hungry is good, and we should definitely do it, but it's not going to solve everybody's problems because people eat, and then a few hours later they're hungry again. So we begin to see that there's many ways to help living beings. And we need to help living beings, you know, 
in terms of food and clothing and jobs and shelter and friendship and all of that. But the best way to help them is to be able to show them the way out of cyclic existence themselves. The best way to help them is to help them stop creating negative attitudes and show them the antidotes so that they can free themselves from their own ignorance, anger, and attachment. Okay. And so we say, well, how can I teach other beings that when I can't even do it myself? I'm completely, you know, my ignorance, anger, and attachment completely drown me. How can I teach anybody else and do that? I've got to free my own mind first. Okay? And I've got to not only free my mind from these attitudes, but I've got to develop my own potential to its fullest extent so that I'm going to be able to tune in to other people exactly where they are and be able to say and do what is most appropriate at any given time instead of, you know, kind of my help being hit and miss. I really need to develop an ability to, to know very explicitly and clearly how to help each and every living being. So when we look around and we say, well, who has that ability to do that? Now, the only ones we can find who have that ability are enlightened beings, are Buddhas. So then we say, well, looks like I don't have a choice. I've got to become a Buddha. Yeah. And the reason for becoming a Buddha is not because I want to be a Buddha because Buddhas are best and people give you <laughs> Valentine's Day chocolate, you know? <laughs> okay? That's not why you want to become a Buddha. Okay? You don't want to become a Buddha so everybody comes in and bows down to you. I mean, you, when you're a Buddha, you don't need that. Okay? But we want to become a Buddha so that we can have all the abilities to really be able to tune into others and to know all the various stages and paths and different things and be able to show them to other living beings in a real skillful way so that they can really derive some benefit. So we develop that altruistic intention to become a fully enlightened being for the benefit of others. Okay? For the benefit of all living beings including ourselves. Okay? So that's the second principal aspect of the path, that altruistic intention. So that's quite an expanded and noble motivation, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the love and compassion that lies behind that motivation is so much greater than anything that we know in our own life, you know? But we have the potential to develop that. So then the question comes, okay, I have this motivation to become a Buddha. How am I going to do it? You know, my mind's totally confused. I'm still ignorant and attached and angry and jealous and proud and skeptical and rebellious and everything else. What am I going to do? Well, then we start looking for the real root of all of our problems. You know, we, we talked last week about ignorance being the root. Well, what is it that ignorance is ignorant of? Okay. Well, ignorance is not only just a not seeing, but it's an active misconstrual, an active misconception. And what we misconceive is <clears throat> our own nature, the mode in which we exist, the mode in which others exist, the mode in which all phenomena exist. And things to appear to us, to our senses, also to our mental consciousness, things appear to us to be very solid, discrete, identifiable things that have their own essence and their own nature, completely independent of everything else. So we feel that there's a me that's right here, that I exist. There's a me that's in command of the show, that's running the show. There's a definite solid me. There's a definite solid cup, clock. There's a definite solid cup. There's a definite solid problem. OK? There's defi a definite solid person that I want to love me. And there's definite solid love that I want them to have towards me. And everything is quite. We, everything appears to us to have its own inherent nature independent of everything else. Okay? And 
That's how things appear to us, and then ignorance grasps that that appearance is true, and it believes that appearance. And it says, yep, everything is solid. And so as soon as we grasp at that appearance and believe that everything is solid, we trap ourselves into a relationship of struggle with everything. Because if everything's solid, then happiness is solid, pain is solid, the things that give us happiness is solid, and we have to get them, and the things that give us pain are solid, and we have to destroy them, because everything revolves around this solid me. And then, there we go, don't we? You know, lots and lots of problems. So, when we talk about the wisdom realizing emptiness, this is a wisdom that realizes that the way in which things appear to us to exist is not the way in which they actually exist. In other words, although things appear to us to be solid and independent, they actually exist in a dependent manner. Okay? And this is... This is challenging to understand because it really uh, shakes the foundation of our whole world view. Because our world view is based on this solid me that wants to be happy. And that's this, the me f feels very independent. But we start to look and say, well, if there's an independent me that's here, what is it? Because if it exists as this solid thing, the way it appears, I should be able to find it. So you start to check up and try and find yourself. Anybody here ever found themselves? <laughs> you know? Can you find yourself? We have this feeling, I'm in charge. I'm making decisions. Who's the I that's making decisions? Can you find that I? What is that I that's making decisions? It feels like it's one solid thing, doesn't it? If it's a solid, independent thing, how can it change to make decisions? Because the process of making a decision means you have to get information, process it, process it. You change in, the, in doing that, and you come out with a new decision. So is there a solid, permanent, concrete self that makes decisions? It would be pretty impossible, wouldn't it? Because something that's solid and permanent concrete can't change. It can't learn. It can't look at different options. It can't even decide because decision involves change. And if things are solid, concrete, with their own inherent essence that doesn't change, that couldn't even happen. Okay? So, in this process of developing the wisdom that realizes emptiness, we start to question all of our conceptions, and we also start to question how things appear to us. And we start to really look and say, if things existed the way I think they do and the way they appear to me, then the closer I investigate, the clearer they should be, the more they should become clear. But the closer we investigate, the more we see that things have very fuzzy boundaries and very fuzzy outlines. And that things exist basically because there's an accumulation of parts and our mind gives something a label and calls it something. <coughs> so we begin to see that rather than phenomena and persons being independent with their own nature, they actually come into existence due to causes and conditions, due to parts, and due to our mind that puts these things together in a certain way and conceives and labels them. Okay? So, you know, for example, we look at the clock and it seems to us that there's a solid one single item clock here, doesn't there? Seems like there's one thing, it's solid, it's a clock by its own nature, kind of like any jerk who walks in this room knows it's a clock. 
If you don't know it's a clock, you're really out of it. Why? Because this hat thing has some kind of clock nature that radiates out from it. That's the way it appears to us. But if we start taking apart the clock, looking for the clock nature, which I won't do, <laughs> but if we took it apart in our mind, and you know, you put the back here and the front here, and some of the digital panels here, and the buttons over here, and the case over here, and you spread out all the parts, are any of the parts a clock? Can you find the clock in any of the parts? You can't, can you? If you put all the part, parts, parts together in a heap, would that be a clock? Be a mess, not a clock. So what is it that makes it a clock? Okay. When we look in the parts, there's no solid concrete clock in there the way, the way we thought there was. But there is something that conventionally we call a clock. But that conventional thing exists simply because there's a lot of parts that came together due to causes and conditions. And then our mind looked at that thing, and our mind developed a conception and gave it a label clock. And because we all had that same conception and gave it a same label, when we use the word clock, we all know what we're talking about. Okay? But for somebody who had never seen a clock before, would they, if they came into this room, would they know that you use this to tell time? You know? It's like I, I heard in, in um, Eskimo language, I think there's like 12 or 13 different kinds of snow, different words for snow. Okay? Now, if you're an Eskimo, you can look at, you know, snow, and it's not just snow. It's this, it's this, it's this, and this, and they all look quite different. If you ask me, it's all snow. I can't tell the difference. Okay? So does snow exist inherently, or do all those other 13 things exist inherently? Or do all of them exist simply because of the way our mind looks at a certain group of parts and conceives of those parts? Hmm? And we begin to realize how much uh, role our mind plays in the creation of phenomena. We talked about this actually the first night, you know, when we were talking about how our mind creates our happiness and our suffering. And here, we're even going beyond just creating our happiness and our suffering by the way we describe a situation to ourselves, but even the way we label an object, you know, it's coming from our own mind. And we can see this very clearly, for example, when we label something mine. Have you ever noticed that after you label something mine, it actually changes? <laughs> it really seems to change. Something inside it seems to change, doesn't it? Like, you know, if this is your tissue, big deal. But if I have a cold, and it's my tissue. And if you try and take my tissue away from me when I have a runny nose, I might drop some bombs on you. <laughs> yeah? Um, and, I mean, have you noticed that? How if you, if you look at this and you say, this is, you know, Susan's, it's no big deal. But as soon as you say, this is mine, it seems as if something in here has changed. And it now has a mine nature in it <laughs> that radiates out that everybody should know is mine, and therefore they should not touch it. OK? That's all coming from our mind, isn't it? Our, you know, we're, we so strongly feel this thing of ownership. 
But ownership is only labels, isn't it? Based on social convention. And yet, we feel like so, as soon as we label it mine, as if it has some inherent <coughs> nature as mine. Look at our body. Our body is definitely mine, isn't it? We feel this is my body. But when we examine, what is our body? Our body has our mom's genes, our dad's genes, and an accumulation of everything that we've eaten since we were conceived. <laughs> Beyond that, is there anything in here that's mine? There's nothing in here that's mine, is there? We've, but it's so funny, isn't it, the way our mind grasps, this is mine, my body. But when we look with an analytical mind, there's nothing in this body we can find that's mine. Absolutely nothing. The genes belong to our parents, and the food belongs to whoever grew it. You know, there's not one single atom of this body that we can say is an inherently existing mine. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about, isn't it? Yeah? And so we begin to see how much role conception plays in how we perceive things and how strong our misconceptions are. How, you know, we're not satisfied with just giving something a label and using that label as a conventional nature so we all know what we're talking about. But as soon as we give something a label, we feel like it gets a whole new entity inside of it. When it hasn't at all. There's nothing there that wasn't there before. It's just, it exists simply by being labeled on that base. Okay. So all that other stuff that our mind is projecting doesn't exist from the side of the object. Okay. We develop so much ignorance, anger, and attachment, and then do so many negative acts, and then get stuck in cyclic existence, because we forget that. Because we forget that things exist by being merely labeled on its parts, and we think instead they have, a ba they have some inherent nature. And even when we say the word I, we think that I has some concrete inherent nature. There's some solid guy there running the show. But you try and look, who's running the show? Can you find one solid thing? We can't. All we find is a bunch of different consciousnesses and a bunch of different mental factors. And they're all dancing around. And on top of that, we label I. Or on top of the, our body, all the parts of our body, all the different aspects of our mind, they all come together. We label I. That's the only way the I exists. There's no solid concrete thing there. Actually, I've talked a long time tonight. <laughs> but anyway, these three principal aspects of the path are very important. Okay, so if you can't remember anything else, remember them. Okay, the determination to be free, the altruistic intention, and then this wisdom that realizes emptiness that enables us to cut the fetters that bind us to suffering. Okay. So we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah. Um, the emptiness, uh -huh. it, it seems to me like um, it, it, another word for it would be expansiveness. It feels expansive. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it is. Emptiness is very expansive because emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Yeah. yeah. Emptiness means empty of fantasized ways of existence. Mm -hmm. And it means full of dependence. Okay, full of things that are dependent. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what you mean by fantasized ways of existence. What I mean by fantasized ways of existence. When we have 
Um, the concept that things are permanent and unchanging when in fact they change. Oh, I see. That's a fantasized way of existence. When we think that things have their own solid nature, when they're empty of having a solid nature, mm -hmm. that's a fantasized ways of existence. <clears throat> Now, I'm not sure, like, I have asthma, uh -huh. and I don't know if it's a fantasized conception of my mind, uh -huh. or if it is um, something unchangeable, just like an illness that I need to accept. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering how I would determine that to move on. I, I'll move on, or I'll keep um, fighting it if, uh -huh. if it's in my mind. Mm. Okay, so you're saying you have asthma. So is that some permanent thing or some impermanent thing? You're changing moment by moment, aren't you? Your body's changing moment by moment. So the asthma's changing moment by moment. Okay, which means it's impermanent. Now, impermanent things can have a very long continuity. Okay? They can have a long continuity. I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose your asthma, you know, whether it's going to have a long continuity or short continuity. But whatever continuity it has, it's never the, mo the same one moment to the next. It's changing, isn't it? Yeah. And what you, it's quite interesting because what you call asthma is basically, you know, you have your lungs and you have your bronchial tubes and this kind of this and this kind of that and all these things are going on and on the basis of all these things going on we just give it a label called asthma. Okay? So asthma is basically something that exists just because it's, it's something that's labeled on top of all those things that are going on, but all those things that are going on are changing one moment to the next. Okay? It's also been labeled bad, not only asthma, but bad in my head. Yeah. Okay, so if you label it bad, then bad becomes bad asthma, you know? <laughs> when um, actually, you can label it good, okay? And why can you label it good? Because if you look at it, there's various reasons, okay? First of all, by the fact of your having asthma, it's helped you develop a lot of compassion for other people, hasn't it? So hasn't it been good? Because you probably wouldn't have been as compassionate as you are now towards other people who were ill if you hadn't have had the asthma. So it's been very good in that way. Yeah. When you think about um, ha developing a strong determination to be free of cyclic existence, <laughs> isn't asthma one thing? <laughs> okay? I'm t I want to be free of asthma in all my future lives. <laughs> yeah? So, it helps you develop that determination to be free. Okay? And when we realize that when we suffer, it becomes, it's because of our own um, mistaken actions, then it gives us a determination to get our act together and not make mistakes now that would cause us suffering in the future. So in many ways, it's something that has been quite good because you've learned a lot from it. Thank you. Okay. Uh-huh. Hi. Um, I'm still grappling a little bit with um, something I wrote, things uh, about the dependent nature. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm thinking or saying is that things exist in a dependent manner because we label them and the way and because we perceive of them being a certain way. Well, things exist dependently and we label them. The labeling is part of the reason why they're, they're dependent. Okay, so things are dependent, first of all, because they, be, they most functioning things, or all functioning things, um, are dependent on causes and conditions to come into being. In other words, we're a functioning phenomena. We wouldn't exist if there weren't causes and conditions for us to exist, right? So we don't exist by our own power, do we? We exist because of the power of the causes and conditions that created us. So we're dependent, okay? 
A second way we're dependent is because we depend on our parts, our body, our mind, all the parts of our body, all the aspects of our mind. We depend on those things because it's all these parts coming together. So we're dependent on parts. A third way we're dependent is that you couldn't even identify all these parts as me unless the mind put all these parts together and labeled me or labeled person on top of it. So we exist also because we're dependent on concept and label. Okay, so there's different layers of dependence. Okay, let's sit quietly for a few minutes then. So this is our digesting meditation. So take something that you heard and, and contemplate it for a few minutes. And rejoice at the fact that we were able to steer our mind in quite a positive direction. Hear new things, begin to broaden our horizons, that we've actually created a lot of positive potential by just stretching our minds and generating some positive thoughts together this evening. So rejoice at that. And rejoice at what everybody else here did. And rejoice too at all the positive, wonderful actions and actions of kindness that any living being has done throughout the universe. and then dedicate all that positive potential so that each and every living being can realize the three principal aspects of the path, can develop a strong determination for genuine happiness, can develop an altruistic intention wishing to become a Buddha for the benefit of all beings and so that each living being can develop a wisdom that clearly sees the nature of reality free from all fantasized projections on it. Let's dedicate for that. Because that will lead to the temporary and ultimate happiness of living beings. So I want to thank everybody for coming. I really enjoyed teaching this series. And, uh...